I'd now like to introduce Sarah Castleman. Good afternoon slash evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to the KW Community Foundation uh, and to Elizabeth and to Lynn especially for inviting me and sharing their platform today. The Foundation's team has really been intentional about creating greater space for conversations about gender equality in our community this year. And so on behalf of local women's organizations, I'd like to say thank you for working to amplify our voices. This is uh, Sexual Assault Prevention Month, and this is the post Me Too era. We are living in a time of social change related to the status of women. I'm here today to comment on the recent report, The Best and Worst Places in Canada to Be a Woman 2019. The fifth annual edition of this report was released two months ago by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. The report brings a local lens to the discussion of gender disparities across a range of areas related to basic human rights. In a nutshell, the report asks if men and women in Canada's 26 largest cities have relatively equal access to resources and opportunities fundamental to their well-being. So the report acknowledges its limitations. Stats Canada doesn't currently collect data on trans and non-binary individuals, and that data would really enrich this conversation. Um, they also don't fully capture the diversity of women's experiences, such as the inequalities faced by indigenous and racialized women and women with disabilities. That said, this report shines a light on some really important data and has generated a lot of dialogue locally, which is exactly what it's meant to do. Too often we become complacent. We accept the world around us as normal or inevitable or just the way things are until something or someone challenges us. Sometimes it's a large scale public report like this one and sometimes it's when an issue like violence against women impacts our lives in a personal and profound way. So before I launch into the specifics of this report and what it means for us locally, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm passionate about women's equality. I'm a preacher's kid, doubly so. My parents actually met in Bible college, waiting for some condolences right now, or <laughs> any, PK, any PKs in the room? Oh. Uh, the support group will be right after this. No, I'm just kidding. My parents are lovely, lovely. Um, so much like an army brat, when you're a preacher's kid, you get moved around, at least back in the day, every couple of years to a new community. And I did that pretty much kicking and screaming for the majority of my childhood. That's my mom, my dear mom, who used me in sermon illustrations for most of her life, and this is payback. So although my mom's beliefs differ from the, mine, she was my first feminist role model. She had to work much harder than my father to be recognized for her work and for her leadership. My father got ordained in his early 20s, while my mom, with the same education and similar experience, wasn't ordained until she was in her 40s. As a kid, people would regularly call her house and ask to speak to the Reverend Castleman. If they didn't specify, I'd of course have to hand the phone to my mother, knowing full well they didn't want to talk to her. But the lack of respect, often subtle like that, really bugged me. When I was a young teenager, my mom was taking master's courses. She was reading the original Greek and Hebrew texts of the Bible, and one day she pulled me aside, and she explained that the first time the Holy Spirit is referenced in the Bible, hovering over the waters in Genesis, it's actually in the feminine tense, like a mother hovering over a child or like Mother Earth, but in the translations we read now, that's not reflected. It was those moments and many others like them that shaped me. I was also the youngest of three daughters, that little cutie, that's me. Um, my sisters were strong role models. My oldest sister was already a world traveler, journalist, 
and many times over novelist when she passed away in her 30s. My middle sister, with a brain for business, is the founder of a very successful tech company locally. So to make a long story short, uh, when I discovered women's studies courses in university, a light bulb went on for me. For the first time, I saw so much of my life, my mom's life, my sister's life, and my friend's life reflected in the curriculum that we were studying. Um, I saw their struggles, and some of them pretty significant, acknowledged, validated, and put into a larger context. Tired of the nomad preacher's kid life, I never left Waterloo Region after going to Laurier. So shortly after graduation, I saw an ad in the record, and the Sexual Assault Support Center was looking for volunteers for their 24-hour support line. So in 2002, I walked into volunteer training, and I found my niche supporting survivors of gender-based violence. I want to tell you a little bit about what we do at SASC. Sexual Assault Support Center, SAS for short. This is my team earlier this month, uh, Wear Purple to Support Survivors event. This year we're recognizing our 30th anniversary. Since 1989, we've supported survivors of sexual violence. We listen, facilitate healing, and celebrate resiliency. Using an intersectional feminist approach, we work to transform systems which promote gender-based violence. Our team, as you can tell from the photo, is a passionate, diverse bunch with highly specialized expertise. We offer free counseling, groups, advocacy, and practical assistance to all genders. We have a 24-hour support line that's been operating in our community 365 days a year, 24 hours a day for just a few months shy of 30 years. We offer... Oh. We offer court support to survivors of sexual and domestic violence. We have a busy anti-human trafficking program, offering wraparound supports to people experiencing sexual exploitation in our community, some as young as 12 and 13 years old. We have a really strong public education program, working across our community with a variety of partners to prevent gendered violence and create social change. TK Pritchard is our public education manager. Wave TK, he's here today right back there. Um, one component of his work is uh, working in our Male Allies program, which works to engage men and boys with their unique ability and responsibility to be part of the work to end violence against women and girls. So sexual assault support centers and shelters exist in our community because of the women's movement, particularly um, the second wave of fe feminism in the 60s and 70s. Although it's oddly still contested by some, sexual violence is absolutely a gendered issue. Sexual assault is a crime of power and control. And why anyone can be a, a victim of sexual violence and deserving of supports after that kind of experience, both police reported data and self reported data confirm that about 87 to 88 percent of those that experience a sexual assault are women and girls, and between 94 to 99% of those that offend are men and boys. So with that, I wanna bring us back to the larger conversation about women's equality. <clears throat> so, you are likely somewhat familiar with uh, the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Their universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Number five on the list is gender equality. The UN acknowledges that women and girls continue to suffer discrimination and violence in every part of the world, including here. As the Honorable Marianne Monsef, our Federal Minister for Women and Gender Equality, recently said, promoting gender equality in Canada isn't just the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. Evidence shows that advancing gender equality benefits everyone. Gender equality itself is an economic driver. Providing women and girls with equal access to education, healthcare, 
including the full range of reproductive options, decent work, freedom from violence, and representation in political and economic decision-making processes fuels sustainable economies and benefits societies at large. So in other words, and I know that this theme is really important to the work that the KW Community Foundation does, true social inclusion, wow, this is an important thing to say and I just flubbed it up right in the middle. It's on the screen. Uh, <laughs> true social inclusion requires that communities prioritize gender equality. So how are we doing nationally when it comes to gender equality? The Global Gender Gap Index can give us a quick snapshot. So uh, Canada moved up on the index from 35th place out of the, I think there was 149 nations in that survey, to 16th place in 2017 and maintained that position in 2018. And that boost was a direct result of the increase in women's res uh, representation in federal cabinet after the 2015 election. So if we don't at least maintain what we have, we're going to be dropping down on that uh, scale in the future. But I want to take a closer look at that report, The Best and Worst Places to Be a Woman in Canada, 2019. So before I comment, I just want to say it's important to note that the difference between first place, Kingston, and last place, Barry, was 7.1 percentage points. So there's not a huge difference between the best and worst across Canada, which is somewhat comforting. So, women in Waterloo Region. Overall, we ranked 17 out of 26 uh, largest cities in Canada. So those are cities, uh, 150,000 and more. We ranked third for women's leadership, 20th for economic security, 22nd for education, 26th for health, that's last place, 26th for personal security. So I am gonna provide a bit of context with much more focus on the issue of women's personal security, violence against women, because that's my area of expertise. But I'm just gonna remind folks that I didn't compile this research. So if you do have questions or wanna learn more about it, the report is really easy to find online. So women's leadership. It's actually women's, uh, this, our strength in this category that pulled up our numbers. If we removed this category and all other things were being equal, we'd be sitting at 23 or 24 out of 26, which isn't an awesome thought. But in our community, women currently make up 47% of elected officials, which is actually the closest to gender parity that exists in any can Canadian city. So that is pretty cool. Outside of politics, women hold 36.1% of management positions locally and make up 29.6% uh, of business owners with employees. Women's economic security, the thing that just really struck me in this section of the report was that on average, women in Waterloo Region are taking home $15,000 less uh, per year than men. Women's education, the report says that overall we're actually seeing similar level of education between men and women in our community, but the one area that we really need to improve on is women's representation in STEM. So uh, in those fields it was, I believe it was one in three um, men had graduated at, from that if they're a graduate, where it was one in eight women. Um, so women's health. This report ranks our community last in women's health. Um, but it is worth noting that the percentage points between worst and best were only 4.3 percentage points in this report. The two particular issues that they noted um, was local women actually experience higher than average le levels of stress and higher than average compared to men in our community. And we also have particularly low levels of screening for cervical cancer. So I do recall um, some quiet conversations in our community, and they were really more ponderings, might have been uh, kind of discussions over coffee, that how amazing it would be to create a women's health hub in Waterloo Region. And this report suggests that indeed our community could benefit more than most from such an endeavor. So for those in that sector, putting that out there. Finally, women's security. 
So across Canada, every city struggles with high rates of domestic violence, sexual violence, including sexual exploitation and criminal harassment or stalking. Violence against women is a pervasive issue. In the past year, though, we've seen some really positive changes uh, nationally as a result of combined efforts of women's organizations, researchers, and journalists. Before I delve into these numbers, it's really important to qualify that this particular section of the report relies heavily on police reported data. I can say with certainty, after years of working in this field, that this is only one very small measure of a very complicated social issue. So this is what we have to consider. Less than 10% of sexual assaults are reported to police and less than 30% of domestic violence gets reported. The vast majority of survivors of gender-based violence never engage uh, with the police or with our criminal justice system for a variety of very valid and complicated reasons. We also have to realize that a higher number of reports could actually signify that a community is having greater success in raising the issue of violence against women. So this report says that our combined reported rates of sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and criminal harassment were the highest out of Canada's 26 largest cities. In 2017, just over 1,300 people were victims of domestic violence in Waterloo Region, with women making up 77.1% of victims. In that same year, there were a total of 788 sexual viola violation reports made to police, which resulted in charges against 265 men and boys and 11 women and girls. This report also referenced the work of investigative journalist Robin Doolittle by noting that local police between the years of 2010 and 2014 had an unfounded rate of 27%. So for those of you not familiar with that topic, I'm going to give you a super brief uh, Coles Notes version. In 2017, a 20-month Globe and Mail investigative series into police reported sexual assaults revealed that 19.4% of sexual assaults across Canada were being labeled unfounded by police. That's a classification that means, in the opinion of police, uh, a crime was neither attempted nor occurred. Basically, across Canada, one in five uh, people who came forward to report a sexual assault had their claim dismissed as baseless. So in Waterloo Region, that number was more than one in four. False reporting in sexual assault cases is extremely rare, so this information was highly disturbing to the majority of Canadians. So due to public pressure, many police forces began auditing uh, past sexual assault files. Last year, locally, I participated in an audit of our uh, police files of 78 cases that had been labeled unfounded. And our review team made 11 recommendations to our police force on how to improve processes moving forward uh, for those coming forward to report sexualized crimes. The overall, the very most promising practice that we have to improve police responses is to have survivor advocates such as ourselves from independent, feminist, community-based organizations review police files on a regular basis and provide feedback uh, to police. So in particular, reviewers are looking for evidence of gender bias in police investigations, and that's what we're trying to work with our police right now locally on heading into case review again next week. So stepping away from what's in the report, speaking from the perspective of a community-based sexual assault support center, is Waterloo Region the least safe city for women to live in Canada? Whoops, there we go. I missed a slide, that's fine. Um, over the last five years, dialogue about sexual violence has increased substantially. First, the Gameshi story broke. Then Cosby came to our community, and that was his first international appearance since the allegations against him had resurfaced and multiplied. Shortly after that, former Supreme Court uh, Justice Marie Duchamp re released a report exposing a culture of sexual violence in the Canadian Armed Forces. Similar stories made headlines about the RCMP. Then there was a, stor uh, a storm about sexual violence on our college and university campuses. Then the Globe and Mail did that investigative series on police responses to sexual violence. 
And it's at that point that Weinstein was exposed in Hollywood and the Me Too movement was born. Our center is on the front lines of this cultural shift locally. We work with all survivors, not just the minority that report their experiences. And our center has been flooded with calls for support. That's a uh, front page of the paper in November talking about uh, the demand for our services. We used to think we were in crisis if we had 40 survivors waiting for counseling, because when people reach out, they need help right away. And at times this year, our waiting list for the first time in our 30-year history topped 200 survivors. So this might not be the definitive answer you're looking for, but I honestly can't say if our community is less safe than others. Here's the thing, though. The crisis around sexual violence has been established. The need is overwhelming. So does that particular nuance actually matter? It's clear there's a significant problem, and it's time that we prioritize this issue as a community. So I started this afternoon by saying we're living in a time of change in regards to the status of women. The Me Too movement was a watershed moment in the advancement of gender equality, giving a powerful platform to women and demonstrating the extent of sexual assault and harassment across our society and in our community. It's encouraging that more women are coming forward, but the movement has also revealed how much has to change to create an equitable society. Gender inequality, at the heart of so much sexual violence, is also called sexism. And like other systemic inequalities, such as racism, classism, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia, sexism requires a multi-pronged approach to address. As I said, true social inclusion requires that communities prioritize gender equality. So to really close the gap for women living in our community, we need sustained action, or the momentum will die down and nothing will change. We need decision makers willing to put in the long-term work necessary to achieve change that lasts beyond the next election at every level of government. And I can't say this strongly enough, we need upstream solutions. We need to value education and prevention work aimed at creating social change. We need to address gender inequality, toxic masculinity, and unpack the root causes of violence against women. We need to talk about power and control and consent and healthy relationships and how to be an ally and how to interrupt sexism and how to intervene, and the list goes on. And as the report says, we need better funding for women's organizations. Survivors languishing on wait lists is not okay. The idea that there's no money to either end violence or support those impacted about it, by it should be challenged and strongly. There is money when something is a priority for an individual, for a community, for a province, for a nation. Become a monthly donor. Talk to our politicians. Make this issue the business of the movers and shakers in Waterloo Region. One of the most effective ways to address social issues in communities be it the opioid crisis or the crisis of violence against women, is to amplify the voices of local leaders and organizations doing this work. They know their sector, the downstream and the upstream, and they know the solutions, but they can't address them without resources and community support. So thank you for amplifying our voice tonight. So to sign off, I just want to share something awesome with you. Because these are the kinds of things that given me energy after 17 years of working in this field. Three local women, and two of them are here tonight. Um, it's Tessa, Jen, and Ashley, but Tessa and Ashley are here. Can you stand? Oh, oh they're right here, right, be right behind her. There they are. Just stand and wave so everyone can see you. Okay, that's them. <laughs> they read this report ranking Waterloo Region as the least safe city for women, and then they read about our waiting lists and they thought those combinations were unacceptable. These are the women of Waterloo Region Crossing, who this year organized a winter adventure trek across our region in support of the Working Centre, raising $45,000 with their efforts. Waterloo Region Crossing is now adding a summer adventure trek to their rotation called Race Across Waterloo Region, or ROAR for SASC. 
This multi-sport adventure race will have participants bike, trek, and paddle across Waterloo Region to explore our landscapes, heritage, and our relationship with the environment, and our relationship with one another. A small race crew, a pilot crew, which now somehow includes me, <laughs> will test run the course on August 17th with a full-scale launch of 100 participants in August 2020. So these women are looking for sponsors and donors and support overall. So if their cause, if our cause resonates with you, please reach out to them. Thank you.